Liz on the ones and twos. <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Hi, We're so excited to be here. I'm Steph. And I'm Liz. Um, and <laughs> Stephanie and I are veal centric. For those of you who may check in on this video for the first time seeing us, we are a podcast duo. And um, we've been having conversations via podcast since December 2020, talking about various um, insights in the music world that we live in as freelancers. And um, we've been very fortunate to make some friends along the way. So uh, we're really happy to be presenting this live to you. And I'm going to let Steph take it from here. Yeah, so we thought in our journey as violists and a lot of friends who we know, we've all struggled with setup, with how our instrument feels in our hands, how it feels in our body, how it feels when we're playing, how it feels after we're playing. And um, we are just really excited to do this very special um, presentation today with some of the friends that we've met along the way who are experts at setup. And we figured if we have questions about setup, there's probably some of you out there who have similar questions about setup. So we've invited our friend, Claire Stefani, who is a licensed body mapping specialist. And um, she calls herself, you can see what she called herself, Claire the pain in the neck lady. <laughs> which we thought was hilarious. Or I mean the no pain in the neck lady. <laughs> but, and also we're joined by uh, the ArcRest team, Erin and Tigran, who are up in uh, Rochester, New York, where they make the ArcRest by hand. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking that we would start this off with Claire, who's an expert on body mapping and, um, and get her to just talk about uh, what she does, what is set up, what does that involve? So Claire, and, off to you. And, uh, what is set up? Well, um, it's a good question. I would, I would switch the, the question yet first to just say, so the setup is for the violinist and, and violist, the shoulder rest and the chin rest. And those names are already wrong because we should call it a headrest and kind of a sub collarbone rest or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're wrong because they um, lead us to make the wrong decision when we fit ourselves, when we, we adjust the setup ourselves. We just accommodate what feels familiar. And most of the time, what feels familiar is not right for the body. So I would start with the question why? would you change a setup? Um, you could change, first of all, because we don't wear the same shoes, we don't wear the same clothes, we have not the same shape. We are, many of us, not built like Isaac Stern, so we have long necks. Um, that would be a first reason, not one thing fits all. The second reason would be because there's pain. Uh, when I get to do what I do, um, when I got to 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 start, you know, moving in that direction, the statistics at the time, and it's ten years ago, was eighty five percent of professional musicians had chronic pain. Mm -hmm. This this is for me. I, I come from the sports background, and if eighty five percent of sports people had chronic pain, there wouldn't be nobody on the field, nobody. And the bizarre thing is we don't speak about it. We speak about stage fright, but we don't speak about pain. And the logic are, if you don't have pain, it's because you don't practice enough, right? So we abuse our body again and again and again, the body say, ah, I have pain, I have pain, and say, shut up. <laughs> so that would be one very good reason to really, uh, uh, to, I mean, look at setup when there is pain and look at this before there is injury. Third reason, because we are told you should hold your instrument with your head and shoulder, like as if it was a, a ham in between the two pieces of, 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 of bread, uh, so that you can move your hand. And uh, that is that will hurt. That will hurt. And it's not because I say so. It's because we build like this. And that's where comes logic of body mapping when we start looking at this region of our body, we, if we had to draw it, we'll draw it like the little Barbie that kind of move our arm like this as a ball and then boom, it gets into the socket. Sorry, I didn't really calm Barbie today. But 
that would be the, the kind of like uh, joint that we think of, right? And uh, then uh, we look at this. Hmm. And this is an arm. If this is surprising you, the way it surprised me at an old age of 50 years old, um, it's time to really look into body mapping before you abuse your body more. This is an arm structure. If anything surprises you and if your idea was more this, look into it. And that gets to me speaking a little bit about uh, body mapping. And uh, what we do during our session is, we first of all, make sure that the body is in balance and that there's no muscle compensation. The setup is one of them, but there can be plenty of mismapping, what we call mismapping, which is how we would design or draw any of our joint, but specifically the, the arm joint and the head joint. If we think that the joint is at a different place than where it is anatomically, we're going to generate muscle compensation. And muscle compensation or soft tissue compensation, most of the time, drive us directly into injury. So I have... I come from the, 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 the musical accessory background. I was for very long uh, working for BEM, then I worked for Dodario, uh, then I worked for Tomastic, and that's what got me to really meet uh, Tigran and Aaron. And I, I love Inventor. I think they're there uh, absolutely with the right ideas. Um, and many of them really create uh, uh, objects that makes our life easier and safer. Um, so I have a bag of those devices because, again, we're not all built like as Stern and all built the same. So I have a big bag. You know, I travel with my bag and my bones uh, because some are going to need a shoulder rest, some are going to need a chin rest, some are going to need body mapping. Um, uh, but there's a couple of no-no. One no-no, one on the top of the list is the Bond Musica. The bond music I will lock your shoulder and keep it there. And the only place it fits is if you have your violin really out and you leave it there. That's oh the, my gosh. the top of dictation, right? I have to say that that's what I was using before. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like, so I often- It feels secure, right? I, shoulder rests are the big, best dictators. They are- providing you with security. Freedom? No. Now, you remove a dictator, you're not going to have a democracy. You, you, you're going to have, if you don't really train a little bit and taste a little bit of freedom little by little to really get to a situation where you enjoy that freedom and you kind of balance freedom with security, you get to anarchy. And uh, uh, that's really where I think the arc rest is a, f a fantastic idea. And I can tell you that everybody, when they say, try this, I feel, oh my God, you know, I hate it more when I give them that because, because it is the antidote to holding. You can't hold with the arc rest. And so once you understand, and that's why I have my bones and my Barbie, once you understand that actually this bone has a ball that fits into that socket and that bones need to travel with it. Therefore, the shoulder can either stay or go. It's either holding or it's going. It can't do both. And once you understand that you have to retrain a movement where this part has to go because otherwise you're gonna dislocate your arm, then you understand why the arc rest comes really at a good place. So, I, I think all this together really, you know, the, the, the accessories, understanding the body, understanding what is it that we do when we play the violin or the viola, which many doctors don't really understand. Then you have the key of what do you need for the setup to work, not to feel familiar, but to make your body work the way it's supposed to work, which is a sequential movement. Playing the violin and the viola has never been just moving your hands. And unfortunately, we learn with our teacher, they're there to learn, teach, teach us the hand technique. And then 
the afterthought when it's there is, well, how do we connect this with the rest of our body? And very often we get to this, as we know all well, but all of us, we would get to this, to, 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 to this point when it starts hurting or when we have injuries that keep on coming. So, yeah, th I would say, you know, the benefits, benefits to really look into setup or look into any kind of muscular tension that we could do without is you remove muscular tension on any um, muscular compensation, you open up the sound immediately. And that's where body mapping and accessories are really great is if you're on the right track, your sound is immediately going to open when you do those adjustments. And again, you'll stay stay out of injury I, I i've never played for money um I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an eternal amateur but i'm very passionate about this i do it the wrong way suddenly i'm going to play three hours of chamber music and play music that i have not practiced but uh really the right accessories the right setup has allowed me to really increase my pleasure at really playing chamber music in a passionate way that um i i wish for everybody that's all I, I want to say. I want to really pass the, the, the voice to Ren and, and, and Aaron. I can't thank you enough to really have, you know, provided. I've found a very, very uh, preferred place in my bag of goodies when I fit people. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I think this is probably a great time Steph and I can share our stories of how we came to form our relationship with ArcRest and my relationship with you. <laughs> So um, I, I have, I mean, so many things you just shared are just completely tied to my own journey in exploring setup. And so, you know, I'll try to make this as brief as possible, but in uh, roughly in 2018, um, I, I actually, I was preparing in late 2017 for an audition. I was just drilling the heck out of my body and I felt something rip <laughs> in my shoulder. Um, and I knew it was a problem, but I was ignoring it because I had too many things to do, which is kind of what life is like for freelancers. Um, but I got to a point where I was just in so much pain and I knew I had to start thinking about doing something. So um, I was, you know, trying physical therapy, things like that. But I happened to get introduced to Claire through our friend Jim Kelly at Potter's and um, you came down and did a setup day and a couple of my students went and met with you and I had a consult with you. And it was the first time I had been introduced to body mapping um, and even just like the concept of major changes in setup. That was something that was unfamiliar to me. I was always a Kuhn Bravo girl and that was pretty much all I ever used. But it was very clear uh, exactly what you're talking about. My, my shoulder was doing this stable supporting of my instrument and it was cause it was just wreaking havoc on my body. So um, I went through a recovery process that was relatively successful in those years. Um, but I just when I tried the arc rest, which Claire recommended to me, um, I, I couldn't wrap my head around how to change. And so I really have the pandemic sickeningly to thank for this because I essentially spent my time off re-examining the way I played and I really leaned into disciplines like body mapping and Alexander technique to just try and understand and it was amazing to me once I started to feel that piece about movement and the freedom of movement and the need for the freedom of movement um the arc rest became it, it just became a solution for me that worked intensely well and still does, even as we've been picking up back into our busy freelancing lives. So, um, but that journey is, it, it is, you have to retrain and th that comparison to being a dictatorship, <laughs> it's just so great. I, I, it feels like that. And then of course you take it away and it's like mayhem, you know, what do we do? Where does all this go? It's, it's just so fascinating. So thank you for that. And I'll let Steph share her own journey because you had a different um, motivation for setup change, but important as well. Right. So, well, just to back it up, I've always felt like I didn't have a setup that was working for me. Um, I have a very, very long neck and um, those standard chin rests for one, 
they're like this far from the body of the instrument. <laughs> so our first in instinct and mine always was, okay, so I need a really tall shoulder rest to make up the difference, right? So that's what I was doing for a long time. I was using the Bon Musica. I was using a coon. I was using um, a Mach 1 with like sponges all over it to try and build it up so that it was at the right angle and the right, you know, the right tilt, whatever, and the right height. And honestly, all of that was working fine for me. What actually instigated my exploration was sound. And I had just been beating my head up against a wall, trying to get more sound out of my instrument. And I always saw my call, some of my colleagues play without a shoulder rest. And I was always like, how in the world? And, and friends who have long necks. So I was like, how are you playing without a shoulder rest? Because I know, obviously, if there's nothing encumbering the back of the instrument, it's going to resonate more. You're going to get more sound. So I was just messing around without a shoulder rest at all for a while, dreaming of a way that I could do it. And then Liz, Liz told me about the arc rest. And so I ordered one. And then I did, like the scientist in me was like, okay, well, this sounds better to my ear, but I have no idea what it sounds like from afar. So I set up a video camera and I took all the shoulder rests that I had. I took, I had a sponge, I had a, um, a Mach 1, I had the, did I use the Bon Musica? I don't remember, but the arc rest was one of them. No, I can't remember what the other one was. There were four, I thought. But anyway, the clear winner audibly, and I put that video up, the clear winner was the arc rest. And so I committed to it. And luckily it was during the pandemic. So I had some time to adjust, but that also took a lot of, like Claire is talking about the, um, the awareness that comes with the study of body, body mapping. So I got a book and I read about it and I tried, kind of tried to coach myself through it. So um, anyway, that's what brought me to the arc rest. And I haven't looked back. And I was honestly, I was a little bit nervous, you guys. I was a little bit nervous about what was going to happen when I got into those three hour opera rehearsals or the orchestra rehearsals where you're just holding your instrument up, like playing Mozart. You know that when you play Mozart, you're like this all the time, <laughs> waiting <laughs> or playing off beats or playing, you know, um, eighth notes or whatever. And I was worried that I wasn't going to have the stamina, but just like any new um, product that you use, new exercise that you do, you have to build the muscles to support your body to do certain things. And I found that after a while I was able to do it. So long story long, um, here I am using the arc rest and loving it. Um, and so of course, when Liz and I, uh, decided that we wanted to welcome sponsors, we immediately paired up with these guys, the Arcrest um, founders, Aaron and Tigran, and because um, we just, we both use it. So what better natural pairing than something that we already love, we already use, and that we can talk really honestly and authentically about. And so with that, I would love to turn it over to Aaron and Tigran. And if you guys could talk about what instigated you inventing this brand new shoulder rest? Like what problem were you trying to solve and how did it start? Well, I guess uh, I'll start, I, I suppose, because um, um, I'll try to keep it short as much as possible, but it goes back to uh, my teenage years, this whole thing. So um, I, I feel like Claire in a, in, in a strange way kind of, told my life story without her knowing <laughs> me, <laughs> right? So um, oh, I played with a coon. Uh, I played with a coon, um, let's see, um, uh, for a few years in my teenage years. And then I, when I immigrated to, to the States, uh, my new teacher told me, he said, no, that's not good for you. Don't use that. And I was like, okay. And it was, it was funny. It was like, he said, how long have you been in America? I said, two weeks. He said, do you have any enemies? Uh, I was like, well, not yet. He said, well, when you do, give that thing to them. Right? So 
uh, to, it, it, it made such an impression. I was like, oh my goodness, I've been doing something horrible to my body. This is, I, I have to change. So, uh, of course, I got rid of it. I got to listen to the new teacher and everything. He, who was a phenomenal player, but who at 17, I didn't know anything but body types and it, the neck length, shoulder, whatever. I, I, you know, I just listen to your teacher. So uh, I got rid of it and I had no idea that it, it requires a completely different way of approaching the fingerboard. Uh, I hadn't even thought about it. So of course, you know, I went like this. I'll go closer to the camera without falling off the chair. <laughs> so, of course, it was terrible, you know, and I didn't know what it's like to, to, to balance the instrument in my hand. And it took years, it took years to try to change the way I approached the instrument and through a pain here, a pain there, all that kind of thing. So, before we even Talk about changing, like if, if any teachers are listening or anybody who's considering changing something, you have to understand certain basic things before you can change something. So uh, I wish I was explained that if you don't use this, you're going to have to learn how to balance the instrument in your hand. You're going to have to play arpeggios up and down, up and down the instrument without having to do this. Uh, I didn't know this, right? So hence began, began the, the journey. Uh, after a while, I started getting the idea of what it's like to hold the instrument in your hand, to balance it, to shift freely. So this is where I would start. In fact, if, if I were to give a recommendation to anybody to change anything, uh, ask yourself, uh, can you play without anything? Just put the instrument where it belongs on your col collarbone, right? And everything comes in, you know, your shoulder blades, everything comes in, come in, and can you... Can you do that? Can you move? Can you shift up and down? I didn't know how to do that. It took me years to get to learn. That. And if I if I was taught, it would have been different. But I wasn't. I was just giving the final product, right? But without what happens until you get there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would start with with understanding that whole relationship of the left hand with the with the instrument. And then once you get comfortable with that, once you understand that you know the bone here and the bone there, they kind of hold things in place. The weight of your head falls down in place. Of course, the height of the chin rest right there comes in because it has to be right height. You go like this and like this. You don't want either. You can stay neutral. I remember Claire was. I was talking to you. You said you have to be able to say no freely, right? So without this. Or that anyway so once you understand that it fits here and the, the makers hundreds of years ago probably had that in mind to even decide the size of the instrument right the, 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 the distance between the two bones and then you realize that you may not even need that much to fill whatever is underneath and that where the body type comes in i think that you have to fit if you feel like you need something more to keep the instrument from drooping too much or whatever. If you have a 17 hour rehearsal, you don't want to have to hold it like this. You want something to help you a little bit. That's when you realize that you have, well, I would like to have something. And at that point, you can put anything you want in there. You can roll up a couple socks and put it in there. You put your old shoe in there, it doesn't matter. But they all affect the sound, right? So my, my, my uh, search for shoulder, my, my, the perfect sponge had started. Okay, I know how to hold the instrument, I know how to do this, but I feel like it's too wobbly, I want something. So, the red sponge, the, the cosmetic sponge, which we would buy from Rite Aid before it was sold in music <laughs> shops, right? Uh, or any other thing. We tried everything. I tried everything. I think we all have. And eventually, my, my, uh, the, the bus came to stop at something like this, where a foam from Michael's, I wrapped around with some shelf liner, uh, just a regular shelf liner for $1.50 from Rite Aid. And I just stuck this underneath there. It's like, I need something, just, just a little bit. I don't need a giant uh, contraption or something. So this thing went in there. Uh, I started using this. I, it's pretty comfortable. And then I met with Aaron. 
And <laughs> I told him these things and whatever. I forget what you used to use. I used a coon for you did. a long time. And then yeah. you said, you need to get rid of the coon. Yeah. See, uh, my teacher is <laughs> coming back to us. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so what, what was your relationship at the time? Um, so a student, uh, student. I'm, I was a student. <laughs> and he was a teacher. Um, yeah. Aaron, right, Aaron is a fantastic mechanical engineer and a wonderful amateur musician and a good player. And see, he just wanted some some uh, experience, you know, with a, with a, with a, to improve. I don't know. Right. Improve my sound or whatever improve. technique. You know. Yeah. So I told him about this whole journey of mine, and I was like, "Look, this is a good thing, but it look how it dampens the sound." I I played for him. I took this thing off. And I played, and then I put it here. I was like, look, I'm kind of more comfortable now, but look how it affects the sound. I wish there was a way to separate it from the instrument. I wish there was a way to dig a hole around in the middle, have as little as possible touch the instrument. I don't even want my whole body to touch the instrument. I don't want anything touching it because it stops resonance. And I knew, like, you know, it was not a crime to have something here because uh, although my teacher made it sound like no good player has ever used anything, uh, I, I, later I learned that, okay, Heifetz had something stuck, sponge sewn into his jacket. Isaac Stern and Zuckerman both stuck something underneath their shirt. You know, they look like that, but who cares? Where and that pain. And, and that thing? They had pain. They had pain. Oh, right, right, right. Pain, yes. Yeah, so I realized that, okay, if players, such phenomenal players like that, feel like, Man, maybe I could do something. Maybe it's not a bad thing. You know, maybe I won't go to hell if I do this. Okay, uh, but it affects my sound. What do I do? So I told this to Aaron, and being the engineer, in his mind, he said, let me think about it. Right. So, so and I'll pass it to you. What yeah. you thought about it? Right, so... <laughs> Two weeks he, later, he came back. Right, so he, he showed me some wood. <laughs> yeah, he showed me the he showed me the sound. I said, "Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's incredible how much it affects it." And so two weeks later, I came back. I only have a picture at this point, but with an original prototype. Um, so you can see it, the the shelf liner wrapped foam, and then I've rubber banded it to a piece of balsa wood, and with five bumpers on it. Um, and the fifth bumper in the middle there was really just to keep it from bending in and hitting the violin. And uh, after a, a few weeks of that, um, I said, I was like, why don't we try doing something a little different? So I put two pieces on top of each other, like plywood, and that seemed to be a little better. Um, it was that one. But it still, it, it kind of still kept bent a it. lot. Yeah. I don't know if you can see, but it's two pieces of thin balsa glued together yeah so That's then right. i i wound up and like well what, what else could we do so i curved it to get through the give a, give a little plot yeah give a little bit of preload and uh you know we just kind of go from there um and so it, it's been a it was a bit of a journey and then it's then we said well okay we we've got this base um what can we do with the pad and uh, so we started searching for pads and that's where we at first we would just rubber band this on top of that right and so we, we went and we had okay so it was we, not for sale it was just for me and, and for me and for him because he thought it was interesting yeah. right it was because of my whole search and all kinds of pain here and there of not finding comfort you know and then i was like fine i found comfort but i i'm sacrificing sound and so i uh so we started looking for for a, a pad that we could do as a uh, you know that wasn't just rubber banded wrap shelf liner. And I still remember the first the first pad I gave him. Um, I did some research on materials and I found something that I thought was going to be perfect. It was durable, had good grip, everything. And I gave him a pad and I said, "This is the pad." And before I even got home, he called me and went. Nope, not it. <laughs> so, yeah. So we set about looking for things and I wound up, McMaster Carr is my, is my best friend. And I wound up placing an order for a, a pack of what they call a foam selector pack, it's like 17 different materials. And I just went, what can we, what can we use? So I started playing with things. And there were a couple that I thought, I really hope this isn't it because it was like super expensive. Turned out it wasn't it. Um, so we, we wound up finding, um, a, a couple of materials that were pretty good. Um, and 
and it wound up so we have the top layer has a little bit of grip to it and the bottom layer has durability so it won't tear from the, the velcro um funny enough one without the other is not as good no it's kind of funny so so yeah Good experimentation right and and then it came you know we got to have a rubber band to hold it to the instrument and uh, and that was another so finding the foam was was about two months um and then we set about finding a, a rubber band to hold it on and uh, that turned into another two month search um, i actually brought it'll be, it'll be fun <laughs> i don't know if you can see it but the amount of rubber bands we went through <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just endless amounts. Like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I learned more about rubber bands than I ever wanted to. Yeah, and 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 the and it had to be the right thickness. It had to be the right durability. It had to be the right length. It had to be this. It had to be that. And because I know how how uh, meticulous musicians can get. Like everything gets on your nerves. Every little thing. You want it to be just simple and nice right so you don't worry about it yeah so after a couple months we got some some samples from a company and i i, I remember i was in boston visiting a friend and i'd gotten the samples in the mail that day and i i pulled them out and i'm kind of playing with them whatever and i found one i well, i think this could be it and so when i got home um i put it on my instrument and and then i i called him i said this is this is the one and again, it was another two month search for a rubber band. Um, but we, we wound up finding the rubber band. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and when, when I saw that one, I was like, that's it. And yeah. within 10 seconds, you know, this is it. Yeah. So we, that was kind of the, the initial evolution. Um, we had people ask us about uh, specific, about different ones for viola. Um, and originally our original thought was we don't need another one for viola. It's, you know, that's all, that's the space you're trying to fill. Um, but then we realized that a larger viola has, is just bigger. And so the size of the, uh, the pad doesn't fit under the, uh, doesn't fit under the rubber band at all. So we had to make yeah, a long, when one. you make a V on the back of the instrument, it's a larger V on a viola. So this thing wasn't long enough to fit. Yeah. So, yeah, so we, so we wound up making a, um, a second one that was just a little bit longer wound up being an inch longer um yeah and you know from there the the product has evolved um so we started out you know like tigran said with uh we had two layers of balsa wood um and then we we realized that it could be improved by adding a third layer of balsa, balsa wood um so we yes. we went to a, a three-layer construction um and and then from there uh i i just had a on a whim i was like well let's let's see maybe we could use like hardwood veneer um to 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 do the the top and bottom layers and so i started playing with that and from there we have our current our current deal um which is we have a we have a maple veneer top and bottom and then we have a balsa wood in the middle um incredibly lightweight i mean the the whole thing weighs less than a half an ounce um and yeah, and then we've gone into composites. Just for fun, room. this yeah. is what our initial viola prototype looked like. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this thing. Look at that sandwich. It looks crazy. It's amazing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, this that is great. So great. It's terrifying. <laughs> this is how much. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> right? I that. love that the viola version is always like the Frankenstein version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, we're so used to that. Like, so violists true. are like the yeah. Frankenstein <laughs> clues. Yeah, totally. I um, it's dawned on me that you guys basically did the the exhaustive process of finding an alternative to a bar rest that everybody who wants an alternative to a bar rest does. You guys did the work and and found took the time to find all the right things to put together and um what a special thing like i i mean actually it's just it it's funny because i'm obviously i'm a i'm a user of the product but i haven't thought about actually how big that is that you did the sourcing for everyone like basically i don't know does that make sense you know and I mean? also the simpler the most complicated process it is to get to a simple product right it's uh yeah. 
I mean, what you say about, you know, I remember when you came with that rubber band, I mean, people say, oh, I want that rubber band, but how can you f find this if you don't know it exists, right? And because yeah. that's yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's a thing really, kudos to you because you have to be determined to really, as you said, to get, I think all the inventors that I know created, you know, fantastic product, they say, I want it for myself. And that, and that we benefit from that. We benefit from the fact that you're so determined to have it for yourself that we know we'll, we'll get one for ourselves too. <laughs> I mean, that was, it was for me and I guess Aaron was interested in it, but uh, uh, it was all my years of searching, you know, and, and uh, when I took one of these, even the earlier ones, it was just very basic, you know, balsa wood with just small like looking sandwich. Uh, uh, I took that to work uh, to the Philharmonic, to the and a couple of my friends were like, well, well, what is that thing you're putting on the back of your violin? I said, well, it's, a, you know, it's, it's something that we, a friend of mine and I came up. Let me try it. Okay, you can try it. And I had five people within a couple of days saying, can you make one for me? No, okay, well, I'll ask Aaron to cut up another piece of that. And yeah, sure, we can make one for you. And from then on, that's how it yeah. started going. And, and people started noticing that, uh, that it helps. It helps with the freedom of the shoulder and the freedom of your body, your neck. But I think um, also when you said that it's a long process, but I think there, there, there are a couple of key pieces to that somatic puzzle. And, and for me, you know, there's that bone and understanding that usually it has to move with the, with the bone because it has the socket. But I think this art press, even so, once people understand that, that that could be really a companion to allow movement to immediately go in the right direction. And I think you can you can speed up that process of putting that somatic puzzle together once you have identified the right pieces, the right final idea, and then. It doesn't, I would say, it doesn't really matter how long the process is if you know that you're in the right direction. And the right direction is less pain, more freedom, more, yeah. but but that is often where we, we, we lose sight of what is the right direction is that there's so many products on the market that do so many different things that if you don't know where to start and, it, and people are going to say it's customizable and this and that, but you have to know what to achieve. And I think the Arcrest is one of the few products that push the instrument away from you so that you understand that it is not something you hold, it's something that sits on you and you just use weight transfer, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I was saying that you have to learn how to balance the instrument in your hand when you play. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that you don't really need a need a contraption that holds it for you. Yeah. Uh, this is the problem that I've encountered the most when I introduced the art press. They say, oh, it doesn't hold the violin for me. Well, it's not supposed to hold it for it's you. Not it's, not, it's supposed to make it easier for you to hold it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so you have to hold it. It's, you have to get engaged with it. Uh, this is not the most natural position to be in. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you put it in the right place and you realize that shoulder comes in, everything comes in, all, the, the, all, this, all this stuff comes in, uh, you realize that actually they're not, there's not that much space left to fill. Mm -hmm. But that's fair for, for your experience, Tiffany, because you have a long neck. The, uh, yeah. many, many shoulder rest says, oh, you know, raise the violin. And that's where you lose the contact with the collarbone. Oh, yeah. the the angle, the more you squeeze, the more the instrument goes. And that's, that's going into the wall. And I think that's where bringing it back here, and eventually adjusting this when Steph and I, we have long necks. It's, it's not going to work another way. If your head is down, your arms are, are, are fighting gravity one way or another, right? So, but I think, yeah, that, that contact with the collarbone and then the right adjustments, then after that, all you need, you're right, all you need is a little anti in the structure that, that supports from under, right? We've we, we, we even had people who switched to the arc rest and then, uh, written us saying uh, you helped uh, you helped me uh, go back to using nothing. Yeah, yeah they stopped yeah. using the art. Eventually, use nothing. You know, <laughs> I, I'm even afraid to say this. Sometimes I play now without anything because it's helped me find a lot of freedom here. 
And when I use nothing, I actually feel like man, I could be okay with this. I've provided mm -hmm. that on this neck, but still, uh, when I put the even when I feel okay without anything, when I put the arc rest in, a sound benefit is what makes me say, you know what, I'm going to use as thin as possible for arc rest. Yeah. But because it helps the sound, it separates it even from your own shirt, uh, and you get more, much more resonance. And it, it helps you release tension. Right? Really, yeah. Releasing tension yes. in your body always turns into medicine. Always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll go ahead. Let's... I'll go, go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry. Go Wait. ahead. Yeah, I was going to say it's kind of a, one of our, we've joked about having a, uh, using kind of a motto of um, second to none and better than nothing. <laughs> Because it's, it's it's better than it's honestly better than having no shoulder rest at all because of the sound. Benefit. Sound, yeah. Because even if you don't need it, right, for like holding purposes, it's good for sound. If you get yeah. just a bit of more air between the instrument and yeah. your body. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was just going to jump in and say um, something that came to mind. Um, Stephanie and I both said that we haven't had an issue going back to the long hours that we play using arc rest. And one of the reasons I think it is, I had somebody notice this in me in a rehearsal recently about my movement, because I'm always just kind of readjusting, you know, I'm always checking in with how my shoulders moving and everything else. And that's one of the things I really love about the arc rest as well is that I reposition it based on how long I've been sitting, if I'm starting to shift in position, however I'm feeling for that day. I have multiple sizes and sometimes one that's a little thicker or one that's a little thinner. It just, yeah. it's, it's variable and there's always access to that movement. And so I, I wanted to just throw this out to you guys, anybody who ha might have a suggestion. I, I would imagine there are some people listening that heard both Stephanie and I share that we used our pandemic time to make this shift. We don't really have that as musicians anymore. Um, are there any additional tips you might suggest for somebody who's trying to explore this amidst a busy schedule? Because, you know, that shift is, it can be a challenge. I know, Claire, you've alluded to just having that awareness. Um, any resources to start? I, I would say, first of all, that uh, if you, so if you press your left shoulder down, if you just try to press it down and try to move your ball up, you're going to feel how much your bow arm is compromised in its freedom to move when there is pressure here. So again, for the benefit of the arc rest is you release the holding here. You release also your bow arm, right? It's, it's every, we, we, there's a, the word in, in body mapping language, which it's a tensegrity. We, we, we have, we have a lot of soft tissue in our body. And when one size is compressed, or tight, it will impact the whole body. Mm -hmm. So I think really having a, a sense of spine and, and torso to, to be our best a friend to fight gravity is, I would say, I would start with there. Because if, if we don't have an awareness of this being a support for down and up, then this is not going to work even more when you really start playing four, five, six hours a day. Um, I, 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 I would do a little bit of work for the center to do its job before you start moving your arms a lot. Um, that would be my suggestion. It's, it's, an, it's, an, it's a good way to put the puzzle together starting from the beginning. Yeah, I guess my, my thing I was, I already said it, that the, I would recommend just simply take everything off. Just Get familiar with it. How did people play for 300 years without anything? Given the given the fact that maybe human beings were a little bit smaller then, I don't know. So uh, you know, they're probably more more. Uh, they're probably longer next now, more no longer next than they were before 300 years ago. I don't know. I was I wasn't there. But uh, provided that uh, if you start from nothing, and then when you start connecting with the instrument. And then you start finding what can I do to make this a little bit easier, as opposed to I want something like you mentioned, like one music thing. I don't even name, name names, but Claire went out and went for it. So uh, <laughs> you know, if you have something that's just keeping your shoulder like this, uh, pushing it away from participating in the game, 
uh, and which means you have to twist more here. Uh, if you have things that are forcing you to be in one position, uh, you've already you've already stopped searching. You're already stuck. So I would start with nothing and okay, play it a little bit, get used to what it feels like to shift up and down, and then think about how much space there is. How much? What do I need to fill it? Maybe your neck is like this. Maybe you need a shoulder rest. Maybe you need even giant chin rest on top of that. I don't know. It depends on your body. But that's my suggestion would be just get connected with the instrument first and then look for something as opposed to, I want something to hold my instrument so I don't have to worry about it. I, I, would, I would do exactly that, Tigran, but I would put an arc rest under so that <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't because I think what the beauty of your product is also it has that really very rubberized foam and very dense and rubberized foam. So the structure that you put under, if it prevents slippage, really prevents kind of feeling. Because we, we again, we need to secure that instrument. And I think what you suggest, I think will take a little time to really get used. But I'm amazed the out of the 1,300 musicians that I've seen in the past eight years, the amount of people say, it's going to fall. I said, no, 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 it's not going to fall. If it doesn't slide, the scroll may go down, but the instrument is not going to go anywhere with your 12 pounds head. It's, it's, it'll be there. It doesn't require force. But by putting a, a, an arc rest there, even at a low uh, height, and that's, I think that's great that you have those different pads of different height, because at least the sensation of not sliding against cotton, it's going to, and not everybody's hands of your being able to play with an open, you know, uh, uh, open shoulder and with, with nothing on it. So that, that logic of really having some, some, some adhesion between the instrument and this area is already allowing everything else to say, okay, I can let go a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question that kind of... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, I, I have a question about transitioning. And I wonder, Claire, if what your thoughts are on this. So all of us musicians, we're in the thick of things right now. If you're thinking about switching things now, do you go cold turkey? Or do you do something in between? What should you do if you want to change something right now? It, it all depends what you've done those past two, three years. If you have not played, yeah, you, you're gonna have, you have let go about some maybe bad habits, some habits altogether. So you can start fresh and that could be a really fantastic opportunity. Um, if you've been playing like crazy and you are, are with a structure that's extremely dictatorial, meaning, you know, bon musica or kind, if you don't feel any movement in your shoulder, then I, I, I would, put on my list to look into it in the next three months to absolutely look at understanding how this moves with the instrument, without the instrument. What do you feel when you wash your hair? What do you feel when you scratch your shoulder? What is that? And how is it supposed to move? What hurts? What doesn't? Right? Because understanding the body will we should start there. When we learn the instrument, we should not start with this. We should start saying, when we do that, what supports our arm, with the violin or without? And there's a lot of things that we do extremely well in everyday life that we completely change when we take the instrument. If you lock your shoulders and you try to wash your hair, you can't get to your head. So how come that we block our shoulder? Well, maybe because we hear shoulder down, shoulder back, so the body starts, okay, I'll pin that back, right? But we don't pin them in everyday life. We don't. So the everyday life and the awareness of how we move our arm around in everyday life could be a fantastic base to just say, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's there. We just modify the mechanical movement from everyday life to playing the violin. And we shouldn't. We don't change bodies. So I think going back to what we feel inside is is a fantastic opportunity we shouldn't hold the instrument without understanding how it feels inside our body and specifically around here right for the violin and the viola that's what matters so that would be my suggestion is giving a little window for that exploration and see what you find
add to that, I remember once I was when I was trying to understand what is it like to hold the violin and play at the same time to crawl up and down. I mean, it just because you always hear that okay, you have to it has to be secure here so you can be free here, right? So uh, I asked this question to one of my teachers, and he said, "Okay, fine, go behind, stand behind me, and I'm just gonna play. You watch me." We would just watch my shoulder. He said, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to play. And you watch it. And it was eye-opening for me because I realized that it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. It's doing its thing. It's instinct. When you're shifting down, it comes in, it helps, it goes down, and then you're drifting up, you don't need it at all. Uh, it's just, it was just swimming around. So which was clear that it needs to be able to move. It needs to be able to move wherever it needs to be. You call Come, come, climb up to the G string, uh, way up high, to, you know, 17th position with a fourth finger, your shoulder is going to have to come in all the way in, you know, all kinds of stuff. So freedom of movement, uh, it had to be there. And uh, to me, it had to be freedom of thought first, I guess, to just not, not worry about security so much, because that sense of security was false sense of security. You get for, you, you start moving freely and that's true freedom as opposed to being stuck in one position where you feel secure. That, I guess philosophically that's where I would start. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> All of this is so great. <laughs> We're just doing so much nodding and I'm watching stuff and we're like, yes, yes, yes. All the way. Yes. Um, oh, this has been so great. I, yeah, I, I wanted to say, I, Claire, you just made me laugh so hard that description. Cause I I'm thinking about like, especially in my previous life as, as someone who played with a different setup that like, I, I, there's no way I could do some of the things I do in regular life, the way I play viola. So it's just funny. It's just funny. And, and that's that. where, you know, we, we, we heard it, you know, shoulder and, and we understand why you are we're saying shoulder down, shoulder back, and uh, it, it's, it's, you don't want to do this, but, yes. but some of those words repeated enough lead our body to, to pin that and, and to suddenly saying, you know, the amount of people who can say, is my shoulders supposed to move? And I show them my set of bones and they say, what do you think? It's not because I say it's ball and socket have to travel together. Otherwise you're in trouble, right? It's a, so, so it's, um, I think it's, it's a, it's an anatomical truth. How many of us have learned the violin understanding what a shoulder is? It, it's, it's, uh, uh, so starting with this, I'm, and I can tell you that the amount of people come to me sometime within one session, whatever their level, I saw last, last Thursday, I saw a lady who was 77 years old, completely amateur. And she came and, and, she, and she was playing like this and kind of moving, kind of, it was so labor intensive. And I showed her the bone and said, oh, it's only a touch here. Oh, that's easy. She was 77 and she had played all her life bad. So certain things are really eye-opening and that's why i travel with my bones because certain things the arc rests feeling that like it's support from under and it doesn't slide the, the bone showing that the shoulder blade has the, the socket those things she, she, I, somebody told me one day how come that i hear that today from you meaning you know she was a brilliant player but she couldn't she couldn't move anymore and and I'm a nobody. I'm a pain in the neck lady. I'm a, I'm a, I'm not I'm not a teacher in a in a big institution. I'm very passionate about movement optimization. That's why I teach body mapping, and that's why I help people with setup. But I am I'm, I'm, that lady should have heard that from her teacher. But we were not at the time, and I think Karen Tuttle in the, for the viola world was one of the pioneers to reading you know, saying you have a body and you'd better be aware of your body before you move your hands, right? But but it, it was not the norm. And maybe maybe we are safer as violists because we can't do it by just moving just our fingers. We, we, we have to really have a sense of what is going to fight gravity. And I think in this case, I mean, I see more violinists than violists. And that, that was, I was surprised. Well, I love that story too, Claire, about the the older woman who came to you and was able to change 
yeah. you know, and it, it changed her playing. And I think that speaks to, it's never too late. Do you think that it's too late to change your, your setup? It is not too late. You can do it too with some extra awareness and some extra information, and which every, is why I think. And every step of the way, it's gonna, it doesn't matter how far you go. It matters that yeah. you start the process and feel that you're on the right track. Every right. time you're going to peel off, and that's where the R crest allows you to peel off this, which is a big deal. At the beginning, you're not going to feel right, but little by little is going to really create freedom here. Every tension that you remove, either by body awareness or by using the right accessories, is immediately going to turn into a better sound. So, so that's where starting the process now, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's not how long it's going to last, it's when do you start? Oh, I love that so much. This has been so informative. Um, yes. Everyone who's watching, thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up this little comment that Liz, that you made so that people yeah. know where to find you guys. Yes. But thank you everyone for joining us today. This has been so great. And um, this video is going to live on our page so you can come back and reference it. Uh, you can also mm -hmm. comment on it. So we'll be watching out for that and we'll be replying to comments, but you can find Claire Stefani um, at voltaservice.com. And you can find the Arcrest guys here on Fairy Facebook, but also on Instagram. And they also have a website called thearcrest.com. Yeah. So I hope that this inspires you to explore. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Aaron, Tigran and Claire so much for Sharing your stories, sharing your insights. Um, mm -hmm. This is it, this is really um, a step in terms of awareness of understanding a little bit deeper about what it is that we do when we play upright um, instruments, string instruments. And uh, yeah, if, if we can get anybody else who's in pain or wants a better sound thinking about this and then it's then it's totally worth it so and yeah thank, thank you guys move your love centric to this together thank you we love this this is going to be a thing now <laughs> <We're in. laughs> thank you for putting it together very thank much you. of course yeah. thank you guys hey cheers everybody cheers, cheers. <laughs>